All right, we are back. We have stolen the mics back from the wives. Um, they are back in the. Should we? I probably shouldn't say back in the kitchen. Uh, Yikes! That would be. That would be. Uh, uh, but we love and cherish our wives. Uh, of course. Um, but a little note for Leanne and Jill: just be careful what you say because right. the mics come back. Right. They, they do come back, <laughs> and uh, uh, she did tell what Jill told me that. They're going to talk about uh, the their mm. engagement stories, which has always been a, a tough one for me. And I, I, I thought she was going to make it worse than what it was, but I appreciated uh, you know because I did have a plan. Yeah. And then the the uh, Fernando Ortega concert got Man. canceled. Come on. And Fernando. then I was like, okay, we'll come up with a different plan. And I was thinking about maybe going out to there was like a country club, okay. like with a gazebo or something, and proposing out there. And then like we're driving down, cool. and it wasn't. It wasn't the actual ring thing because okay, that yeah. was in my pocket, ah. but it was like the cardboard box that the ring Man, came in, and marketing. I did not do a good job of. I I thought I had it hidden, but apparently it wasn't hidden. Man, and then it was like just derailed from there. So <laughs> I was like, oh, hey. like everything was like unscripted. But how many years have you guys been married? Uh, twenty two. Oh, sorry, don't okay, twenty two. Yeah, I was like, oh, 22. I'm not trying to help you dig a deeper. Yeah, that was yeah, great, but no, twenty two no, years 22. later, twenty two. Yeah, still, we're going strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You go on duck hunts and things are good. Right? It's like that's that's a test yeah, of yeah. a strong marriage. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, yeah. Work, worked out. Yeah. Um, I was trying to think of of things Leanne Leanne said on there. Um, there, she said something about me and uh, the doorbell. Did, what What did she say? Yeah, that that she yeah. the best thing she got this little yeah. electronic doorbell and that you don't like it when you're up there it always like scares you because you're not used too to much, it. Too much, too. It's actually a great idea, but you know, no. honestly, I thought I thought they great. We actually haven't aired their episode yet. Yeah, but I'm but just we've assuming. Heard it. Yeah, 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 we've heard it though. Yeah, we've heard it, and you'll have heard it by the time you're That's hearing right. this. Yeah, because we're recording this just a little bit early. <laughs> um, one question Jill oh, yeah. had. Yeah, because she had th- she. Your wife was talking about y'all's engagement and walking along the beach, and then mm. there was a blue light in the sand, Whew. and the blue light was never explained like what it was. Yeah, uh, my memory might be failing me, so Leanne can. How maybe... long have y'all been married? <laughs> Not twenty-two years. <laughs> to, uh, t- wow, I think twelve years. <laughs> now that I'm on the mic, I'm losing. Yeah. Uh, 2012, 12. Yeah, yeah. So we we yeah, had a twelve-year yeah. mark. Okay, so so yeah. we were. What what month were y'all married? August 11th. So we're exactly 10 years apart almost because we were August 4th, oh, 2002, nice. August 11th, 2012. Wow. So you're saying, what I'm hearing is you got my back. Sure. Like your, your anniversary comes first. Yeah. So if you guys are celebrating yours, I know, oh, I got to get on my game. <laughs> right, right. But right. this blue light, um, Leanne was trying her best to just totally ruin this engagement at every every step she could unknowingly. Like uh, I had a message in a bottle. She talked about it, but she was like, oh, I don't want to touch a gross gross bottle like no i'm like maybe it's not gross maybe it's really important yeah, yeah. you're gonna grab that did it i think the blue light might have been maybe it was like marking like a spot like i had light i had like a it was like old school had a remote that when i pressed it a bunch of lights mm. but i think i might have had one already um blinking or there so i knew where to go where everything because it was on the mm-hmm. beach it was dark um i'll tell you what too just a lot of extension cord going everywhere <laughs> it, it was it was kind of crazy i'll have to show pictures we uh um, yeah, if you give me pictures, oh, sure, I can put them up here. It's like one of those the camera, like we didn't have like professional pictures taken yeah. in the moment, but we had like uh, it's like you know like when you take a picture in the dark and there's lights and the lights are like running a little, like you know moving. There's a lot of that right, going right, on right. where it's kind of crazy, but yeah, yeah, yeah. documentation that actually happens. Yeah. So talking about trying to make things go awry unknowingly, um, Chris had gotten some. Have you heard this story when he proposed Luana? I don't think I have. He had gotten some Cracker Jacks Ooh. and he had put the ring inside the oh, little that's so good. The little toy. Yeah. So that, you know, it, and and when Luana got it, she was about <gasps> to throw it off the cliff because they're always like, she's like, these are just cheap uh, little toys. And he's yeah. like, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> yeah, don't throw uh, that one. Man, cra- do people still do Cracker Jack boxes? Have they taken, like, they used to be a thing they when I was a kid, and I know they were like before that. Yeah. I haven't seen a Cracker Jack box uh, in a minute. I think you can maybe find them at Dollar General and yeah. Cracker Barrel or something like that, but they used to be big everywhere. Yeah, it used to be a thing, but that that's smart. Put the nice ring yeah. in there and just, right. uh, yeah, I'll have that, we'll have to ask him about that next, maybe next home groups he can, yeah. Yeah. he can share that engagement stories. If, if she had thrown that off, Chris could have said, that's not right. <laughs> I, I was looking for a way to do too. <laughs> so Michael beat me to the punch. Uh, title of the sermon today, the 28th sermon 
in Romans is God. That's not right. Really, this response that that Paul is hypothetically, you know, raising and answering in Romans nine. So let's go ahead and take it to the next level. From the hearts of the Low Country in South Carolina. It's the Take Two Podcast, where we take theology to the next level. Romans 9. Romans 9. A tough one. Pastor's working his way through it really well. And, you know, what what Pastor does well, he does several things well. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what he's done well in this passage in particular is he has stuck so close to the text He's not doing a ton of these outside illustrations. He's trying to use the text illustrations. And on top of that, he was doing, uh, and he's staying in the, con- he's really reviewing this context, which he will mm-hmm. do. But he did this really cool thing where he got a couple of the younger children, <laughs> yeah. um, like teenage, like yeah, young, yeah. young adults, yeah. I don't know, like 12, Tweens, 15, 10, 12, something, 11, 10, 12, yeah, yeah, 12, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to actually participate no, in, nice. in an illustration. Good. Those kids will probably never forget Romans 9. That's right. That's right. Because he gave them some clay and said, here, here, make something with the clay. And uh, one of them made a, a, a fairly nice cross with a heart. The other one, I'm not sure what he was making. He he asked it for <laughs> some extension, some extra time. Uh, but yeah, it no, good. it's good. It's a good lesson and illustration. Sometimes I struggle with illustrations. I want to get the text right. Mm-hmm. And I've People have all sorts of illustrations. Sometimes they can really drive home a point or help you understand, but sometimes they can distract if someone's not careful about like <laughs> yeah. tying. You're like, that's like the only thing I remember right. or I can't tie it to the point or yeah. didn't really make the point. It was kind of adjacent. It's kind of hard to weave in like perfect ones, but you can't get more perfect than uh, taking it directly from the no, text. No, that's good. That's good. Oftentimes when I'm teaching, it'll be the next day of like, Oh, that would have been a perfect way to <laughs> yeah. illustrate that. And uh, so what, what I've tried to do now, especially if I'm teaching a sermon or something, I'll try to maybe type it up a little bit a couple of days ahead of time. Oh, yeah. And that way, because I'm, I, I'm generally busy enough that I'm like on Saturday, if I'm preaching oh, yeah. for Joel, like that's the day I'm like trying to pull everything together. And that really, you know, I think there's something that your mind does kind of in the background. Sometimes it, it you think of things yeah. a day or two afterwards, you know, no, that, 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 that's good. Um, the kind of things we're wrestling with today that Pastor Joel really helped explain are, you know, this idea we're working our way through Romans 9. It's it's really not fair that that God chose to extend mercy to some, but not others. And if, if that's how things go when God is sovereign, it's how is it right that he holds people accountable? Mm-hmm. Um, he's got this quote by William McDonald. It, you know, in s- some ways, it seems like we're all pawns on a divine checkerboard. What agency mm-hmm. do we have? Mm-hmm. If this is the case, so I think really I good questions. What, what checker game <laughs> William pawns. McDonald is playing that has pawns in it? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's what I was wondering. I was like, pawns on what's, a checkerboard. Okay. <laughs> uh, spoken like that. What, 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 what's your what's the title? Are you a chess coach? A chess sponsor? Like what? Yeah, do you call I yeah. get called both of those. Yeah. yeah, chess coach, chess sponsor. Yeah, yeah both do, of those. Do yeah. do it all well. Um, what we can jump into, it's so helpful. Everyone just like takes a passage in Romans 9 and fights about it, but it's like work your way back up to yeah. that context and see the big picture, and then you kind of you kind of get a lay of the land. Yeah, that's good. And so what Joel has consistently done is taken us back to the end of chapter 8, where we see this, what has, some have termed the golden chain of redemption. Um, it kind of starts off in 828 and we know that god causes all things to work together for good to those who love god to those who are called according to his purpose and then here it comes for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren and those whom he predestined he also called and these whom he called he also justified and these whom he justified he also glorified those are all past tense speaking of you know this past action that had ongoing effects but really, you get that, and then you read the end mm. where it says nothing's going to separate wow. us from the love of God. Huge, Big triumphant time. things. But then someone might be going, Paul, just look around you. Yeah. What's going on with the Jews? They're, they're falling away. They're not, not all of them believe. Has, has his promises failed? There's, it, it's such, such a good thing to consider because I think of myself, and I think of my brothers and sisters at Charleston Bible Church, and my view is, most of these people have a relationship with God. This is great, right. but can you imagine being in a context where you mm. look around and you're like, "Man, good news for me, sure, but it's like, why has mm. um, why has this not worked out?" You know, yeah. if Jews were um, God's chosen people, so I think that that's good. Just 
like you just mentioned that verse, verse six has the word of God failed. Um, it's it's keeping that in mind. It hasn't failed. And then Paul, mm-hmm. Paul's going on saying, this is why, because God is sovereign, mm-hmm. it has not failed. We've got this quote we've mentioned a few times by Douglas Moo, Moo. If God's plan depended on the vagaries of sinful human beings for its continuance, then indeed God's word were to fall into the ground long ago. But God's purpose in history is fulfilled because he himself elects people to be part of that purpose, that it all hinges on God. Because mm-hmm. if it hinges on me, man, I do a lot of things good. I do a, far more things bad or <laughs> right. drop the ball or sure. miss something, yeah. yeah? Yeah, so this section, last um, sermon and this sermon are what could be formally called a diatribe. We use that word a lot of times. Oh, that person just went on a diatribe. Like this is the formal, mm-hmm. and in Webster uh, and Marion actually call it the archaic Ooh. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, I see that. Definition, but it's a prolonged discourse. But we're going to see mm. uh, Paul engage in a prolonged discourse against these hypothetical objectors. And that's what we covered last week. You know, it's not fair. Mm. And in what the question is, if God has mercy on some but doesn't have mercy on all, mm. then we don't think that's fair. And then what we're going to look at today is that um, God – is going to, you know, if that's the case, then how can he hold us accountable? And so we would say, that's not right, God. Yeah, that that's the objection Paul is anticipating. Who can resist his will? How can God find fault? How can God be just? All this, all these thoughts are running through um, the uh, Paul, Paul and maybe his uh, pe- people in his life, these Jews, their, their mind. And so here's the answer up front. You know, doesn't the potter have right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use. So this is the answer. We'll go ahead and, and develop it um, because it, it is a hard, it is an emotional mm-hmm. thing for you know what fairness actually is versus what we want. Yeah, I think I think because when I talk with people and I've said, well, God could send us all to hell. Yeah, yeah He could, and that would mm. be fine. Or God could send everyone to heaven, and that would be mm. fine. Or I think that that they that they would want it to depend on the person. Yeah. Right. The person is making the difference. The person is deciding, okay, I want to choose God. Because those all seem okay with us. Either yeah. you know, universalism, everyone gets saved. Mm. Uh, I don't know what the name is if we all go to hell. Cool. Universal I justice. Know I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't really want that, but yeah. we'd say yeah. it's fair. Or if, hey, God kind of brings, and I think this is what the typical Armenian does. Everyone, mm-hmm. God brings everyone kind of up the, to the same level, and then they decide, you know, it depends on the person. Well, the Bible explicitly says it does not depend on the man yeah. that runs, but it depends on God. And that's what people are uncomfortable with. It, it's very uncomfortable. Even even if I know scripture, this is something, it's just something in yeah. you. Like, I think Pastor Ezzy was talking through it, like, maybe struggle is not the right word. Maybe it is, but it's mm-hmm. something that you have, and you're like, oh, but... We, you know, submit Mm -hmm. to the word of God. So looking ahead at this passage, Paul in verse 19 starts with the criticism that we mentioned Um, in verses 20 to 21. We'll bring an illustration and then the rest of the passage, 22 through 29, he gives a little application um, and wraps up uh, a conclusion, quotes some Old Testament text. Um, So we'll go ahead and work our way through this, starting with that criticism in verse 19. Yeah, so this is verse 19. We're actually going to back up to verse 18. Um, it says, So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Who will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Or who can resist his will? Or who resists his will? And I slipped into a different trans- translation there that I had memorized. <laughs> we got a few few tra- translations <laughs> up here. And, and you read something like that, and you get this idea that, man, everything's rigged against mm-hmm. us. It's like, what? How can he find fault? Like, mm-hmm. if this is how it goes down, what can we do? We mentioned sh- pawns on a checkerboard. <laughs> um, the NLT's translation, I like this, says, well, then you might say, why does God blame people for not responding? Mm-hmm. Haven't they simply done what he makes them to do? Mm-hmm. And I think this probably is the natural response. Right. And I, I think if I were answering this and not Paul, because Paul's going to answer it clearly his way, I would go, okay, well, let's go back to Adam. Yeah. Adam was our, you could either say he's our federal head or we were in him like in a genetic, genealogical sense. And Adam sinned on behalf of all of us. So we all sin. We all have original sin. We're all guilty. We're all going our own way. He plunged all of us over this Mm. cliff, and now we're all running away from God. And God chooses to mercy some. 
But yeah. <clears throat> Paul's answer is a little bit yeah. more punchy than mine. It's very punchy, <clears throat> and he just he doesn't beat around the bush. He gets right to the point. Um, in verse 20 and 21, he says, On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why would you make me like this? Will it? Or does the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? use basically he's just going right at this creator creature distinction that yeah. you're not like god Mm-mm. your perspective's not like god like how almost yeah how dare you like right. even <laughs> even question <laughs> like, in this tone right you know what what is god to do yeah because i i can i think we can all sympathize with the concern yeah and yeah. uh paul's gonna be like yeah not yet. I'm not really even going to answer that because you're thinking the wrong way. You're, you're, you're <laughs> yeah, coming he, at this the wrong he's way. He's just coming. Yeah. I, I, and I think he's just cutting it off right there. Um, the message um, says it this way. Uh, and this really kind of uh, maybe brings a little bit of flavor to it. Who in the world do you think you are to second guess God? Do you for one moment suppose any of us know enough to call, call God into question? Clay doesn't talk back to the fingers that mold it saying, why do you shape me like this? Isn't it obvious that a potter has a perfect right to shape one lump of clay into a vase for holding flowers and another into a pot for cooking beans? If God needs one style of pottery, especially designed to show his angry displeasure, and another style carefully crafted to show his glorious goodness, isn't that all right? Um, I like the liberties taken with the message yeah, yeah. for the with the vase of flowers with the cook. It's like right. different purposes, right. and you know we don't you know get mad at these uh, mm-hmm. you know people who produce these different types of pottery and this right. kind of thing. It, it's a, it's a good argument, but like you're saying, man, it's hard, hard. It just hit punches you in the face. Yeah. And I, I have often prayed and I, I would encourage you if you are a parent or you have loved ones who you're praying for, I, I pray God, I ask you to make them a vessel of honor. Like that's what my yeah. prayer is. Yeah. For, yeah. And, it's really and good. I, I think the God of eternity hears those prayers and you know, he can act like we're asking God to move and to, to have compassion yeah. and mercy on them. And I, and, and I think it's, it can be tough. It, I know it's tough. It's one thing for us to talk about this in the yeah. abstract. Mm-hmm. It's tough when you have a family member you've been praying for, oh, for man. years and years, you've presented the gospel, nothing seems to work. And you're like, and you, I think there can be a somewhat legitimate, this doesn't seem fair. Mm-hmm. And this is what Paul is exactly addressing. And, you know, the pushback isn't just limited to your everyday lay person. Um, Pastor Joe will often uh, reference Barclay's commentary, particularly for its historical Mm -hmm. insight. Um, And his notes here is flat out, man, Paul uses a bad analogy. (laughs) Um, One great New Testament commentator said that this is one of the few passages which we wish Paul had not written. And that's, that's... I mean, whew, you think about writing a commentary. That's one way to go to say, like, right. I don't, I don't, this is bad. This is bad. I don't like this. <laughs> Paul made a mistake. I don't know how you, I, I'd like to read what that person says <laughs> I know. on the passages that say all scripture is God breathed and profitable. Like, yeah. How did they interpret that? And then, because I'm assuming they can still consider the scripture and you, God you would breathed, think. right? And, and it's one of those things, I mean, <clears throat> and on one sense, yeah, I definitely don't agree with it, this take, but I uh, kind of like, uh, the honesty there, instead yeah. of saying something like, well, what Paul is really saying, and then like watering it down to where <laughs> right, he says nothing. Right, that's right. the other thing yeah. you, you can try. I don't know. Mm-hmm. That's a tough one to do with this what passage. What Paul said when he said X is what he really mm. meant was Y. You know, yeah, and, and it's, it's like, oh, people do that yeah. kind of thing. Um, so, so that really sets up, uh, you know, the criticism, the mm-hmm. analogy, this potter and clay analogy. Then Paul is going to move on um, to application uh, in 22 the ver- 22 through 29, we'll look at application part one, 22 and 23. Yeah, so this covers verses 22, 23. It says, what if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath to make his power known, endured with much much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Mm -hmm. And so kind of going back to these, you know, the different types of clay that he can make vessels of honor, vessels for common use, vessels of wrath, vessels of mercy. Um, God's the potter and he is making these vessels. And I think Joel did a good job. Like there are definitely verses that talk about our responsibility, Mm. our sinful nature, our desire to be our own ruler. Those are in the Bible Mm. too. 
Um, and when we get to those, we preach those, we teach those. But right now we're in Romans 9. <clears throat> this is big that's on God's right. sovereignty. And so that's what we're doing. We're preaching and, and teaching those. God makes those mm. vessels so that he can demonstrate himself to us. It's like, yeah. how do we know he's merciful if we don't know he's also yeah. just? How do we know he's just if he's not also merciful? No, I, th I think that that's good. It's what's at stake <clears throat> is God's glory, and God is all these things. He hates sin. He's just, he's perfect. But he's also loving, merciful, gracious, and kind. He's all of these things, and this is how we see he displays, he's chosen to display mm -hmm. his glory. It's the same kind of thinking, I think, when it comes to something like the atonement. Yeah. Everyone wants to emphasize, you know, God, God loves you, but they don't want to emphasize that there was a price to pay, right? Oh, yeah. And it's like, it's all these things. It's not balanced, and... Mm -hmm. Um, we might not understand it, why it has to be done this way to its fullest extent, but um, man, God is, I like this, you have this in the notes, Michael, the just justifier. That's yeah, I almost Romans. screamed that out. I was like, <laughs> should I pull a jack here and, and yell out the just justifier? Uh, but that's what was ringing because that's what he's demonstrating. I'm just, I'm wrathful. Yeah. I take sin seriously. At the same time, I have provided a way for you I, I can justify you because of that. So it's those two natures of, of himself that he's revealing to us. And that that's so good to keep keep that in mind. And at the end of the day, you know, you can read this text with God's glory in mind. You can read this text with me in mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, getting that focus on him, I think, helps clarify mm -hmm. everything else. And, and this is the part of the show where Michael sings a song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he had in here, it's ultimately about God and his glory and it's about him, not us. And I, I, have you seen this parody song where this guy sings, it's all about me for my I'll glory up, yeah. and my fame, you know, taking the, <laughs> oh, no, taking gotcha. the song that, uh, okay, yeah. that was originally written. It's all about you, um, and it's all about Craig, me, yeah. but it's all about me. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, and, and also not only the part of the podcast where we sing, but it's the part of the podcast where we go to the Puritans. <laughs> That's right. Jonathan Edwards. <laughs> Pastor Joel's getting the heavy hitters out. You know, you're getting into some deep, Deep theology. Um, Jonathan Edwards has this extended quote um, that Petrol quotes. Uh, he writes, It's a proper and excellent thing for infinite glory to shine forth. For the same reason, it's proper that the shining forth of God's glory should be complete. That is, that all parts of his glory should shine forth. That every beauty should be proportionally radiant. That the beholder may have a proper notion of God. It's not proper that one glory should be exceedingly manifested and another not. So evil is necessary in order to the highest happiness of the creature and the completeness of that communication of God for which he made the world. Because the creature's happiness consists in the knowledge of God and the sense of his love. And if the knowledge of him be imperfect, the happiness of the creature must be proportionately imperfect. That if we don't see the full picture of God... right. We, we're not, we can't glory in God, be as happy mm -hmm. in God because we, we don't understand his full character. Yep. That's right. That's, I think that's right on. All right. Application part two. So now we're taking verses 24 through 29 and really Paul's going to turn to the old Testament and show support of God uh, being merciful in caring, uh, caring for and caring through this remnant of Jews. Uh, so it starts out even us whom he also called not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call those who are not my people, my people, and her who is not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved, for the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of the of Sabaoth had left us to a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. So even in the old Testament, God is preserving his people. And there's speaking of him calling out a new people for himself out of the Gentiles. Yeah. I think that's pretty striking <clears throat> that we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah Yeah, without, without you, but God in his mercy pulled out a remnant. Um, moving on to the conclusion, verses 30 through 33, Paul starts to starts to wrap, wrap up some of his arguments. He says, what shall we say then? The Gentiles who didn't pursue righteousness attained righteousness, 
even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at the law, at that law. Why? Because they didn't pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it's written. Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Um, I'll make a note before I kick it to you, Michael, but what I love about Paul as he's dealing with this, you know, theodicy, that this problem, trying to vindicate God's righteousness about Jewish people specifically, mm-hmm. he's just layering in Jewish after text. He's just Old mm-hmm. Testament's in here a lot. Right. He's like trying to show, no, God's word hasn't failed, and this mm-hmm. is what the God of the Jews has said. Mm-hmm. No, that's good. Um, Joel a, a couple times went to the message. Uh, mm-hmm. So here's an, that same passage that Zach just read out of, is it Peterson's message? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He says, how can we sum this up? All those who didn't seem interested in what God was doing actually embraced what God was doing as he straightened out their lives. And Israel, who seemed so interested in reading and talking about what God was doing, missed it. How could they miss it? Because instead of trusting God, they took over. They are absorbed in what they themselves were doing. They are absorbed in their God projects, in scare quotes, that they didn't notice God right in front of them, like a huge rock in the middle of the road. And so they stumbled into him and went sprawling. Isaiah, again, gives us a metaphor for pulling this together. Careful, I put a huge stone on the road to Mount Zion, a stone you can't get around, but the stone is me. If you're looking for me, you'll find me on the way, not in the way. Yeah, we find this kind of thing quoted a lot in the New Testament, I feel mm-hmm. like, the, this stumbling the stone. stone. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, this imagery that, you know, that the Jews missed it, and, yeah. and Jesus was was right there, stumbled over him, because, mm-hmm. you know, focused on, on works and not by faith in the Messiah, who right. was right there. Yeah, and Joel's like, you know, he could either be a stumbling stone or a stepping stone. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a, good. That's a good, good uh, turn of a phrase there, because if you recognize God, God, for whom Jesus, for whom he is, you recognize yourself for who you are. If you let the law really be the tutor that it's mm. meant to be to show you, you know what? You're not going to keep the law. You are going to daily break the law. You're going to, you know, daily need some type of uh, sacrifice. You're not ever, you know, you're, to go back to the Sermon on the Mount, your righteousness is not going to exceed that of the scribes or Pharisees. You're not going to be mm. perfect as your Father in heaven is. And so now you can go, okay, I need help. And then that's where the stone comes in, stepping up. Ab- ab- absolutely. And so I think as we end Romans 9, it's good just to consider this whole flow of argumentation. Um, has the word of God fail? You know, is God fair? God, can- that can't be right. And then as we get into chapter 10, we look a little bit more at the means God uses because mm-hmm. I think the accusation, you know, levied hard against people who are big on sovereignty of God is then I guess you don't witness. And it's like, oh, well, <laughs> chapter 10's a lot about the yeah. means and witnessing right. specifically. So it's like, you know, I think those things are together in Paul's argument for, for a specific reason, right? Because these things, you know, really complement each other. Yeah, if if you are, as someone who I've defined as a hyper-Calvinist, mm-hmm. then, then you're not taking the full counsel of the word because we're still to pray, we're still to witness, because yeah. we don't, you know, we don't know how God even uses those in his That's right. His sovereign plan. So you know, we're, we're supposed to be about that. So application number one, he who believes in God will not be disappointed. Um, and he gave this illustration of this kid who gives his mom this face <laughs> mask for good. Christmas. is like, hey, mom, this face mask is supposed to make you pretty. Put it on right now. And she puts it on, takes it off. It's like, uh... Didn't work. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's so good. So by contrast, uh, you believe in in Christ. Your faith is in Christ. You're a child of God. You you're not going to be disappointed, even if that means you don't understand everything totally. That that's part of faith yeah, too, right? Yeah. That you will not be disappointed. That that's a gr- that's a great first application, um, because you know I think that that is that emotional side. Mm-hmm. You just don't understand. You know, man, why is people close to me? Why why is this not working right. out how I would hope? Yeah, and if you find yourself in that place of disappointment, you know, I would just say go back to scripture like Ephesians one, mm-hmm. all that we have in Christ, Romans eight, which we just read about, you know, all creation's groaning. We don't ever we don't understand how we're supposed to pray necessarily. The spirit is groaning on our behalf. First Corinthians fifteen, we're gonna get a new body, we're yeah. gonna get a resurrection body just like Jesus. Revelation twenty, there's gonna be a new Jerusalem, we're gonna be with him. 
you know, there's not going to be even need for a son because he's going to mm. be our light, all of our tears. Like, so we have all of these promises for this future hope and mm. what God's done for us that we should be able to go, okay, in the here and now, I don't exactly understand what you're doing, God, Yeah, but I'm, I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to be disappointed in you. Oh, so, so good. Application two, you know, thinking about divine sovereignty and human responsibility, I think you know, Pastor Joel said it well. I'm going to preach what the text says. There's another text that's going to talk about human responsibility. I will preach that hard as well. And I think people unfairly just put pigeonhole people into one, one or the other. And it's like, yeah. why can't we have both, right? Right, right? You know, why can't we just agree that Scripture speaks to both and maybe we can't totally um, in our minds reconcile everything perfectly? This great quote by Warren Wiersbe says, No one will deny that there are many mysteries that connected with divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Nowhere does God ask us to choose between these two truths because they both come from God and are a part of God's plan. They do not compete. They cooperate. The fact that we cannot fully understand how they work together doesn't deny the fact that they do. When a man asked Charles Spurgeon how he reconciled divine sovereignty and human responsibility, Spurgeon replied, I never try to reconcile friends. And so I, I, I think sometimes you can be so focused on one of those you can kind of minimize it yeah. it's a good it's a good give and take a good balance i think at the end of the day you just want to be anchored mm-hmm. to some a text right and that and that helps but no one's saying your actions don't matter right yeah and i think you have to be faithful to the text and then you got to find out you know in your systematic theology which <clears throat> everyone has whether they realize yeah. it or not you have to figure out a way that you can kind of be true to all these different texts, like what way of understanding salvation or what way of understanding who God is really can be faithful to all these different texts and how we understand them. And so, um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's texts out there that talk about God's sovereignty texts that talks about, um, our responsibility and you really should not, shouldn't be a, a cause of argument because it's clearly what scripture says. Right, right there. It's in the Bible. That's why we believe in the sovereignty of God. Um, people can get bogged down. It's not, these are important truths, but you can really get bogged down and not, and be talking past each other. Um, and then kind of that concluding passage that Paul mentioned that, you know, Christ is a stumbling stone, but you're not, not for us. If you have right. faith, faith in Christ, you can um, rest, rest in this truth and not and not be like the Jews that were, you know, just mm-hmm. trying to work it out on their own. Yeah, yeah. Then we looked at uh, communion because we took communion today, and um, he, you know, his blood inaugurated the new mm. covenant. And I don't, you're, you're not a big movie guy, so I'm going to make <sighs> a reference you Ooh, may or may not see. get. Um, yeah. How to Train a Dragon? Have you seen? That? Oh, I have not. I've heard it's good. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So, like in that in that movie, in the second movie, and all the series, like there's the main character Hiccup. He'll always say stuff like they'll find something out that's new or, and he'll say, this changes everything. I was like, that's, we need to take that okay, clip yeah. from him saying that and like married up with yeah. like something like, you know, the blood of the covenant or wow. Christ's resurrection, like this changes everything. And it should be a cause for us to rejoice in, in who Christ is and what he's done for us. Romans nine, Romans nine in the books, in the books, moving on to, to Romans 10. Um, still got a lot of, lot of Romans to go. A lot of Romans to go. I can't wait to, you know, we get to that last chapter. We'll get a lot of wow. names in there. Oh, <laughs> that's right. You'll get Michael's whole family in there. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah, Phoebe and Julia are in there, I believe. Wow. Yeah. Pretty pretty cool. Um, any Anything else you got, Michael? Uh, no, I, I'm good. Awesome. That's our take. Thanks for listening to Take Two. Find us wherever you find podcasts and on YouTube for those who want to watch our videocasts.